good morning, everybody. I'm a little bit undone by this morning. Oh, man, just the beautiful worship, Brendan and Karen and the team. Thank you. Um, but hearing Diane's testimony about Trevor, man, that, wow, <laughs> that's really quite stunning. Um, I'm not quite sure where to go, but I really do feel like there, you know, as Brendan and, and Karen shared in the worship, there's a beautiful sense of God's presence here. Um, and I feel like in this church, he's doing something of the, of the ancient, but of the new, something that has been here that's always been a wellspring here, but he's stirring some things again that are very, very precious. And now uh, you're a people who know, <laughs> you're a people who know what it is to worship, to worship deeply, to worship honestly, to worship truly. And um, that, that really comes across. And I really believe that you are blessing the heart of God every week. And it's not just what you're doing here on Sunday. It's the way you're living out your week. Um, thank you, Wiki, for leading us this morning as well. Just, you know, there's such a beautiful sense of the preciousness, a deposit of the beauty of, of God's spirit here. And it's being lived out and walked out through you all. Um, and I think God's going to do something very, very precious here. Yeah, just like I said, I don't know what it even means, but there's a, a combination of the ancient and the new. There's something that, you know, this church has, there's been a well here and God is redigging and reforming and refilling um, that spring that's coming up and just keep pressing in, keep pressing into worship, keep pressing into what God's doing here because it's very, very precious. And I, I feel, I sense that people are going to come into this place and receive healing in all manner of ways physical, emotional, heart healing, spiritual healing. Um, you know, I just, when Diane shared the testimony this morning about her brother, that like just that unction of the Holy Spirit, just to, just to, you know, hear the Holy Spirit. And I'm actually going to share about a little bit about that this morning, but to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, to obey it and to step into that. And if Diane had not done that, if she had not obeyed what the Holy Spirit had said, you know, where would Trevor have been in those following couple of years? And yet his life spoke of the beauty and the power of the gospel. Um, we need to be ones who know what it is to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and obey it. And so, oh, hmm, I'll just compose myself for a second. But um, yeah, I, I, what I do want to share, like I, um, I understand you've been doing the Worship Matters series through e-groups, maybe. Carl mentioned something, or maybe going to that, I'm not sure. But um yeah, or going into it. So, so we, I, both Wayne and I tonight, if you come out to the 5 p.m., who's coming to the 5 p.m.? Yes. Like, yeah, everybody, everybody. Like, come on out. And, and if you've got friends here from other churches who aren't, you know, as the guy said, who aren't attending a, a night service, invite them along because I think God's going to do something really powerful again tonight. Um, but we're going to be talking about worship, both services, but not, not necessarily the worship that we expect or what we expect worship to be. Um, as we shared the team yesterday, you know, a lot of what we talked about wasn't to do with music and singing. It was about the heart and where worship comes from. And so this morning, I guess I want to um, share a little bit of that, plus share a bit of a biblical um, view on something that's a story that we've heard, but it's a bit of a twist. Ooh, it sounds like a movie trailer. <laughs> but a little story with a twist. <laughs> but um, oh, but before we start, we've got some resources down the back too. We've both written books, but Wayne's aren't here because um, we just haven't gotten any at home. <laughs> but um, but you can order those on Kindle. Wayne's book's called Rebranding Worship, and it's just it's it is really good. <laughs> we haven't it's not we haven't got them because we don't want them. It's just that we yeah we haven't managed to get any more in from America. But um, but Wayne's book Rebranding Worship. Um, is all about worship, but nothing to do with music. So again, it's about, it's a biblical journey through the Old Testament, and it's really, really insightful and deep, and very easy to read, but conversational. My book's called Journey, and it's just really my own journey, which is not yet finished, but um, my own journey to intimacy with Jesus through worship, through life events, all of that. That's the journey we're all walking, eh? So um, feel free to have a look at that at the back at the end of the service. But um, I do want to just share, like I said, about worship this morning, um, and a couple of weeks ago, Wayne and I are leading the worship stream at Equippers College in Auckland. That's our main, our main thing. We love discipling young people and seeing people come through and being trained in worship and, and leadership. And it's just such a joy and a privilege to do that. And we have, 
every year we have a lot of international students, but not this year. So, but we do have one student from Germany who, who was in the class last year and is interning with us this year um, called Diane. She's from Germany, as I said, and she's awesome. And um, a few weeks ago, we were doing our morning devotions time with the class and Diane was leading the HQ part or team rally where you just give some vision for the morning and one of our other students was leading worship so they both shared what was on their heart and Diane just said you know this morning I really feel this this phrase don't fear the silence don't fear the silence there's there's a trust that comes when we're in that silent place don't fear the silence that's why I feel we're pressing into this morning and then Alana who was leading worship said well I'm sensing this morning that we need to sing a little louder and make our praise loud <laughs> and I'm like okay cool 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 we're gonna, um, <laughs> slightly kind of contradictory statements don't fear the silence sing a little louder but, um, but as I thought about those two statements I thought no they're not actually contradictory because they're actually those two working together in the place of silence is when we need to dig deeper and actually bring a, a praise and a worship that comes from a very, very deep place. And, and I want to share my, a little bit of my own journey um, regarding that because in 2008, at the beginning of the year, I'd felt the Lord say to me, and some of you may have heard me share this story before, but I felt God say to me, this is the year to step out in greater um, boldness and preaching and leading and worship leading, the prophetic, and all that sort of stuff. I'm like, cool, cool, cool. I've got my word from God. I'm gonna step out in greater boldness and, and all, in all areas. And at the same time, I started losing my voice. Uh, and yeah, mm, good one. Like, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> you know, um, isn't it funny though that when the, when the Lord speaks a word, the enemy often comes with a pushback. How many have experienced that in their lives? Mm. So, um, so anyway, so I felt this word from God. So I'm like, okay, well, cool. But then I kept losing my voice. Every Sunday I'd lead worship, voice would just go. And, and so I'm like, God, what's going on here? And I, you know, we prayed, we prayed for healing. We asked God to do something. Nothing happened. Voice kept getting worse. And a few months into the, into the journey, I thought, I need to see a specialist. And long story short, I had some cysts in my vocal folds that needed, uh, required surgery to be removed because they don't just disappear by themselves. They're not, it's not like um, vocal cord damage that's been caused by misuse of the voice or nodules, nodes, whatever. They were cysts. And, and the specialist said to me, you're going to have to have surgery. And I'm like, um, are you? You know, like really tender vocal fold, slip of the knife, voice gone, you know. So anyway, so I was like, well, let's keep praying. But my voice kept getting worse. And so a month later, we said, well, maybe this is the route God wants us to take. You know, he didn't heal my voice, so we opted for surgery. And, uh, and part of the journey um, in, in terms of the, the healing after the surgery was 10 days of complete silence. Like, I know, I know, 10 days. I'm not talking about... Wayne, that's enough. <laughs> Wayne was obviously rejoicing in those 10 days. But, <laughs> but I mean, 10 days, so 10 days of complete silence. I'm not just talking about not talking, complete silence. I couldn't whisper, I couldn't laugh, I couldn't talk, I couldn't sing, I couldn't do anything that I traditionally know as a way of communicating. So 10 days, I had to text you know, like I had to message, Wayne, put out the rubbish. Um, <laughs> you know, I learned how to text nag quite efficiently. <laughs> but, and, um, and Sam, Pastor Sam and Kathy bought me like a, a magna doodle board thing. It was shaped like a frog. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and so I would have to write messages and, and communicate that way. And it was, but what I was scared of was the silence. I, I remember thinking, what do I do? How do I communicate when I've got no voice? God, the beginning of this year, you said it's a, it's a year to step out in greater boldness. And now, here I am now with no voice, not being able to speak or do anything that would look like that word. What is the deal? And I felt God was just teaching me a new way, a new way of worshipping. And, and the funny thing was, um, uh, three days after the surgery, I was at church. And I'm like, so how do I worship? How, how am I meant to worship this morning? And hear me on this. I know all the head knowledge. You know, worship is not about the songs you sing. It's about the life you live. I knew all that. I'd teach. I'd taught on that and preached on that. But right now, at this moment, I was standing in the middle of, am I going to know how to live this out? What if, what if I can't, you know, what do I do this morning? So I thought, no, I'm going to just determine. I'm going to worship and praise as loud and hard as I ever have, just without any noise. 
And I remember standing on the front row of church and determining to raise my hands and praise extravagantly. And I mouthed all the words. And to anyone looking on, they would have thought, oh, she's worshipping loud. But there was no noise coming out. But I, I've got to say, it was probably one of the most powerful worship times I've ever experienced. Because all of a sudden, I'm like, there's something in here. In, in the depths of my soul that is singing to God right now, I can't make any noise, but there's a sound that is of the Spirit that's coming out of me that I've never experienced before. And so, so I'm like, oh, wow, like I'm not limited by a voice. Like worship is something completely other than that. What we do on Sunday, we all, you know, probably understand that what we do on Sunday is just the overflow of, of what's lived out during the week. You know, the songs and the music, really, they are an expression of worship, but they're not the worship. They're a way that we have to express what's in our hearts, but what's in our hearts is the key. And so... So I'm like, this is, wow. And then, and then on day eight of the journey, I was journaling. And, um, and I was quite in a, quite a vulnerable place because I'm thinking, what if my voice doesn't come back? Like, and it's not about singing for me. I didn't care about singing. But it was, I wanted to fulfill the call of God on my life, what I felt he'd spoken to me and what I knew that we were heading towards. So I remember writing in my journal, Father, what if, what if I can't sing again? Like, what if I don't? What, what if I can't? What if I get to the end of this and find that the surgery hasn't been a success and the knife slipped? And, you know, what if? And, and I felt God answer me with a question, which is really frustrating. <laughs> Has anyone had that happen? Well, you know, you're like, you ask God a question and you're expecting this lovely spiritual biblical answer. My daughter, whatever my grace is, I might have healed you, whatever. He answered me with a question. And he said, you know, my, my question was, Father, what if I can't sing? And he answered me and he said, my daughter, will you still sing? Wow. I'm like, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> I'm saying to God, what does that mean? And he, and he just, I just felt him say to me, even if you never can utter a, a note or a sound again, noise, will everything about the way you live your life be loud in its expression of worship to me? And I said, yes. I remember thinking, this is what this journey has been about. Don't fear the silence. Don't fear the silence, but sing a little louder. Make your praise loud. Don't fear the silence. Sing a little louder and make your praise loud. It doesn't matter what situation we are in physically. We always have a choice to sing. We always have a choice to make our praise loud. We always have a choice to exalt the name of Jesus, whether it is heard physically or not. It comes from here. And so that journey was like, oh man, it, like it really just, even though we've been involved in worship for years and years, that formed something very deep in me. Just, I guess, this rock solid understanding that praise and worship were to be the sound of my life in, in every area, not just in church on Sunday. And so, oh, my computer's gone to sleep. But then, so, excuse me a second. Should have put it on thing. So, so here's the thing. In Acts 16, and this is the this is the Bible part. So, in Acts 16, we read the story of um, Paul and Silas. And you're probably all nodding your heads, going, "Yeah, yeah, we know that story. Yeah, yeah, Paul and Silas. Yeah, they're in prison. They get chained up, and they choose to sing. They choose to praise. They choose to worship. And and yes, that is what happened. And but often we we look at that story in isolation as a really great example at worship conferences or series on worship. <laughs> we look at that as an isolated story." But we don't often realize the context that that story sits in and the context of um, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, obeying it, choosing to walk that out, finding yourself in a place where you have to respond and then realizing that this is part of a much bigger picture. So I want to unpack that for you this morning because this is an incredible story, an incredible story. So in Acts 16, Basically, at the beginning, this is Paul and Silas um, and maybe a couple of others are on missionary travels all around, you know, parts of, of um, the Middle East. And they've been going to different places and planting churches. And Paul, we know, was, you know, the apostle who had been radically transformed by an encounter with Jesus, like radically transformed, like knocked off his horse, Jesus appearing to him in a vision, and then his life turns 180 degrees the other direction. He was the biggest persecutor 
persecutor of Christians and the church, and he turned 180 degrees because of an encounter with Jesus to be the greatest apostle, like just zealous and passionate for the cause of Christ. And so here he is traveling around planting churches and And somewhere in Acts 16, there are some mentions of the fact that the Holy Spirit forbade them to go to certain places. So it says, you know, we wanted to go here, but the Holy Spirit said no. Then we wanted to go over to this place, but again, the Holy Spirit forbade us from going. So they're listening intently to the voice of the Holy Spirit on their mission, on on their journey. They're listening intently to where the Holy Spirit is leading them. You know, like, should we go? Nope, the Holy Spirit's no, we won't go there then. And then um, I'll just bring this up on my... My Bible app. Um, in, hang about. So, um, so, and then in verse, in verse six to eight of sixteen. It says this, they went through Phrygia and then on through the region of Galatia. Their plan was to turn west into Asia province, but the Holy Spirit blocked that route. So they went to Mysia and tried to go north to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them go there either. Proceeding on through Mysia, they went down to the seaport of Troas. And that night, Paul had a dream. A Macedonian stood on the far shore and called across the sea, come over to Macedonia and help us. The dream gave Paul his map. Isn't that cool? The dream gave Paul his map. We went to work at once, getting things ready to cross over to Macedonia, and all the pieces had come together. This is the message translation, by the way. We knew now for sure that God had called us to preach the good news to the Europeans. This is their first journey into the, into the um, continent of Europe. And we all know, I mean, obviously looking at the church now, um, if he hadn't been obedient to where the Holy Spirit was leading him, the whole church wouldn't have opened up in that region. So then it goes on and it talks about this journey of Paul and Silas going into the the region of Philippi, which was a really big Roman stronghold. It was like the strongholds of strongholds. It was an incredible Roman colony where a lot of Roman soldiers retired to a real stronghold of Roman um, the Roman Empire. And so they they go there and they encounter a few people on the way. They've got their map, a dream. The Holy Spirit led them. They, he had a dream and they're like, right, well, that's where we're going. And they, they end up in, in Philippi. Um, and the first, the first um, person they meet is a, a group of Christians or first people they meet is a group of not Christians, but Jewish converts. So converts to Judaism, not Christians, who are having a prayer meeting on the river and they encounter a woman called Lydia. Everyone read that story before? So Lydia, and they tell her the good news. She gets converted and her whole household baptized and then, you know, converted to Christianity, not Judaism. Next, they're walking along a few days later on the way to the temple and they, um, a demon-possessed or a, 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 a um, psychic woman is following them, calling out, obey these men, follow these men. They are men of God. Listen to what they're saying. But they knew the spirit and who was not the spirit of God. It was a mocking spirit. And Paul was getting really frustrated, so he cast that out of her. And um, there were some men making money off her sorcery gift. And so they get really angry and they pull them into the town center or whatever, and they accuse them of some stuff, and Paul and Silas are thrown into prison. Um, so they've, they've converted this, you know, sorcery woman, um, and then because of it, they get thrown into prison. It'd be really interesting to, to think about what Paul and Silas are thinking at this stage. Like, cool, God, cool. Like, okay, we came here on a dream from the Holy Spirit. We came here to plant the, the church and, and tell the good news, and we're in prison again. <laughs> here we are in prison again. But, um, but what's really interesting, and this is, you've got to understand this about this Roman prison, there were three levels of Roman prison. And they, so there was the, um, what was called the communiora, which was kind of like a low maximum, minimum security. They, they still got fresh air, fresh light. They were still able to kind of commune, the, the communiora. So they were allowed to kind of interact. There was fresh air and fresh light. That was the first level. Second level was called the interiora. That's probably like what we would expect prisons to be today. Locked doors, no fresh air or light. A little bit, but, but kind of they were locked up. And then there was the tulanium. And that was like the dungeon of the prison. Complete darkness, no fresh air, no fresh light. And the prisoners were in shackles. Uh, Not just shackles like around their feet. They were like stocks. Anyone, you know, those fairground attractions where you put your arm and your head through and take the photo? It was kind of like that, but worse. (laughs) 
If they were, in, they were in, in shackles and they were stretched. So their legs and their arms were stretched to unbearable pain. This is what Paul and Silas were thrown into. Basically, the Tulaneum was where men were sent to die. So this is the prison <laughs> that Paul and Silas have been thrown into. And this is where we come then to this story of, oh, Paul and Silas were thrown into prison and they chose to praise. Woohoo! They chose to worship. I mean, fantastic. And we go, yeah, that's awesome. That would be my response too. <laughs> like, seriously? Like, they were stretched to the point of unbearable pain, but their choice was to praise. I'm going to unpack this a little bit. And because of their choice, we all know the story, earthquake came, shackles were removed, some people got saved. Cool, cool, cool. We think, what an awesome story. What a great picture of um, God's power, you know, and the breakthrough of praise. And yes, it is an awesome story of what happens when we choose to praise in the middle of our situations. But I want to kind of unpack this with four points this morning. That's the kind of the overview of the story in Acts 16, and then we go on to read some more. But if you're, if you're writing notes, uh, this is all about some choices that we make this morning in the midst of situations, in the midst of walking out this life of worship, walking out this mission that we are called to. And the first is we need to choose to listen. We need to choose to listen. We have to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit daily, not just at church on Sunday, not just when we're listening to a bit of a podcast, you know, like those are all great things. We should not neglect our gathering together as church. As, as the church, but we need to be living this out on the daily in our personal lives. Yeah, we know that, eh? So the voice of the Holy Spirit, Paul and Silas were fully led. Holy Spirit forbade us to go there. Holy Spirit blocked the route. The Spirit of Jesus said no. And then I had a dream. Paul had a dream, a, a vision in the night, and he knew he had his map. So every, every point along the way, he was listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. We need to be people who on the daily on the daily, are saying, God, what do you want to do in my heart today? What do you need to do? Father, who do you want me to talk to? You know, just like Wiki, you know, with the cuz, you know. <laughs> like, who do you want me to talk to? Is there someone that's going to come into my world today that I have a message of hope for? Will you give me the boldness to speak out and do that? We have to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The vision of the Macedonian man, I believe, and I'll unpack this in a second, that Macedonian man, that, that vision was what drove them. It gave them their map. It gave them their mission. It gave them their reason. That man was calling to them, and they knew that God's purpose was to see a significant church planted in that region that would then go out from there and reach all of Europe. If they had not listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit, what would have happened? We wouldn't have equippers churches all over Europe right now. The church wouldn't have spread. The church wouldn't have grown. Like the, the long reaching, that's why I say we can't look at these things as just an isolated chapter. We've got to keep looking at the big story. So choose to listen. Number two, choose to walk. Choose to walk. You know, the Bible says um, that the Great Commission is go into all the world and, and make disciples. That's what Jesus said to us. That's your mandate. Go into all the world and make disciples. I used to think that meant um, go to India and be a missionary over there. If I'm called to Africa, I'll go. But if I'm not called to the missionary life, I don't actually need to be a missionary. That the translation, the original translation of that verse is as you go into all the world. As you go. We all have a world that we're walking into every day. As you go into all the world, make disciples. As you go about your everyday life. As you go into your workplace, into your schools, into your... Oh, the kids are gone. There's no one at school here, is there? No, no. Anyway, <laughs> but, but as you go into your everyday world, make disciples. That's our mandate. And so, so don't miss the on-the-way moments. Don't miss the on-the-way moments. You know, it, it says when they got to Macedonia, one day they thought they, they heard of a church or a prayer meeting that was happening down by the river. So they went there and they connected with the people and Lydia was the result. Lydia, the rich woman, she was the, probably the funder of the Philippian church. And Wayne often says everyone, every church needs a rich woman in it. <laughs> she was like the financial kind of, like the financial foundation of the church. But it was an on the way moment. 
They were going, they heard about a, 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 a prayer meeting, so they went down to the river and met these women and these people, and Lydia and her whole family got saved and baptized and became a foundational member of the Philippian church on the way. Then it said, you know, a few days later, as they were on their way to the temple, that's when this demon-possessed woman started calling out. And so Paul, frustrated at the mocking spirit, delivered her, the, then, and then, you know, on the way, they got thrown into jail. Like, but, but it's all... The Holy Spirit is always engineering. Pastor Helen Monk always says, God's always knitting behind our backs. Knitting, 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 stitching things together, like putting threads together and making this big picture that we can't always see because we can often be stuck in the moment. Just looking at today or a situation rather than seeing the big picture. We've got to keep seeing the big picture. So, so, you know, Lydia and then the demon-possessed girl. I mean, this is only my kind of reckoning or supposition, but maybe she became the the, um, deliverance ministry chick in the church. Maybe she had a prophetic gift. She obviously had a natural prophetic gift. It was just being used by the wrong spirit. She was a psychic, uh, but same gift, like God gifts different spirit using it, but when that's redeemed, so maybe she became the, the prophetic ministry of the church. Maybe she became the one that was able to then bring deliverance to others. I don't know. It doesn't say that, but maybe. So on the way, um, choose to walk and don't miss the on the way moments. Um, one little example, a few years ago, I was really asking the Lord you know, to, to kind of use me in my everyday life. Like we, we're in this ministry, so we've got this ministry space. But I was like, but Holy, Holy Spirit, I want to see you do things through me on my, in, my, in my everyday, on the way type life. And so one day I was going into, oh my gosh, into the Vodafone store to get a battery for my phone. And um, I'm like, okay, Lord, what, what might you do through a conversation here, you know? And, um, and there was two cues here, I was here behind a lady waiting to be served, and there was another lady waiting to be served here. And then we both moved up to the counter together. And I'm, I'm like, right, here's my chance. So I was looking at the, the girl serving me, and she had a beautiful big ring on her finger. I said, oh, that's a, that's a beautiful ring. She goes, oh, thank you. I said, is that an engagement ring? And she goes, oh, it was. I'm like, oh, <laughs> um, awkward. <laughs> And she said, oh, yeah, it was an engagement ring. I was engaged, um, actually ended up pregnant, and my partner didn't want the baby, wanted me to abort it, and I didn't want to, and so he left me. I'm like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, I'm like, it's not really working out how I expected it to. And then the girl, the lady in the queue next to me said, oh, I know how that feels. I'm like, oh, um. And, and so she said, yeah, I'm in a really similar situation. Just And I'm like, oh, this is really atrocious. Like, Holy Spirit, I don't know what you want to do here, but this is not how I expected this to go. And so and she started sort of, and you could see she had like a tear running down her face. The girl that was serving me looked very tense. I'm like, okay, well, thanks for the battery. Um, have a great day. God bless you. And I walked out of the store. I was like, this is awful. But I clearly felt the Holy Spirit say, don't let that lady leave without talking to her. And so I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So I hid in the store next door. (laughs) So I'm I'm crouching behind, you know, (laughs) pillar in the next door store in the mall. And I saw her walk out and I just kind of approached her, kind of pounced on her actually. And, um, And she looked a bit taken aback. But I said, I'm really... I'm so sorry. I did not mean to open up something that's obviously very painful for you in that store. Like, but do you need to talk? And we were walking through, and she said, yeah, that would be great. So we just ended up walking through the mall, and she just started unpacking her journey with me. Um, you know, at one point I said, look, I'm a Christian. She goes, I could tell. I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You can see, you know, oh, you know, in our own strength, we've got nothing, but hopefully with the Holy Spirit in us. But anyway, and so she unpacked her story. She was in a desperate situation, had been through a cancer journey, um, a partner who didn't like her 17-year-old son and basically said, you know, in the midst of this cancer journey, basically said, you choose your son or me. And she said, I can't make that choice. Of course, I choose my son. And he left her in the middle of, and so she could identify with the story. I said, I'm so, so sorry. And in the end, we got to outside the countdown supermarket in the morning. I said, look, uh, can I pray for you? Meaning I will go home and pray for you. And she said, yes, please. And she closed her eyes. I'm like, oh my gosh, right here in the mall where people can see. (laughs) So, 
But anyway, but I just, you know, so I prayed for her and I just asked for the comfort of the Holy Spirit to be with her. And it turned out she actually had a Catholic background. So she had a, an, a bit of an understanding of God, but hadn't really come into a place where he was real to her. And I, so I just said, God, I don't know what you want to do, but just be near, be close, just be her everything, bring peace and comfort. And then we exchanged numbers. And I said, if you ever want to talk more, here's my number. I'd love to have a coffee and just chat with you. And you know, to this day, I've never heard from her. But that's not my that's not my responsibility. I, I put a hand out, I listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and I don't know who then came into her world that could take that a step further, but I know that our God is good and in the big picture of everyone's journey, he's working things out and will bring the right people along at the right time. But we need to be aware that we can be a piece in that journey for someone. So so um, that was an amazing sort of sense of on the way. Don't miss the on the way moments. Choose to walk. Choose to walk out your everyday life with the sense of, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do through me today? And then number three, choose to respond. And this is kind of the Paul and Silas response I'm talking about. And I talked about the three levels of prison they're in the Tulanium, the, the dungeon, the place where people are sent to die. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that they probably had to make a hard choice to praise because they had built a habit of it. They knew what their mission was. They knew who their God was. They knew what he'd called them to. Like I said, they probably ended up in that prison cell and they're like, okay, their first response might have been, okay, God, what are you doing? But we know you've called us here. We know there's a mission and we haven't seen the Macedonian man yet. We haven't met that Macedonian man yet. Yes, Lydia and her family have been saved. Yes, we've cast out a demon from this you know, um, woman and, and, and she was probably going to be part of the church. So we're on a mission to build the church, but we haven't seen the man in the vision yet. So maybe, maybe we're going to see him here. Our mission isn't finished yet. The mission isn't complete. What you've called us to do is not complete yet. So Jesus will praise you. So God will exalt you. As we are here stretched in these chains and these shackles and unbearable pain, we choose to praise. I love, maybe they were singing, nothing's going to steal my joy because my joy is it. Nothing's going to stop the praise my heart longs to give you. Like these are songs. That, I think that's why I love some of these equippers praise songs because they are deep theology wrapped up in a happy little bouncy tune that makes us go, this is lovely. And then when we realize what we're singing, I see the trials ahead as joy. That's straight scripture. And nothing's going to steal my joy because my joy is not in my circumstances. It's not in you answering my prayers. It's not in you working everything out the way I expect you to work it out. My joy is in you. My joy is knowing that you are good. My joy and my security and my safety and my anchor is my relationship with Jesus. Nothing more than that, just that. Nothing's going to stop the praise my heart longs to give you. So they're there singing this. They're there singing this song. Man, not that song, obviously, but we might hear it in heaven. But, but they're there singing and praising because they have chosen that to be their response. They know the power of lifting up the name of Jesus. And the story we know, um, you know, the, the, the um, earthquake comes and all the prisoners who are in the Tulanium as well, and maybe the communior as well, they're all hearing the sound. They're all there in chains and they're hearing a sound that is very different from anything they've ever heard before. They're probably used to hearing moans and screams and cries and pain, painful, agonizing noises. And yet from this tulanium, they're hearing, Jesus, you are lifted up. Jesus, we praise you. Jesus, you are exalted. Jesus, you're the name above every other name. Jesus, you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we give you glory and honour and praise. We give you everything that you deserve. Nothing's going to stop that praise and that worship. This is the sound, whether it was sung or spoken, that's what the other prisoners were hearing. And they're probably listening going, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm feeling, just like we felt this morning, I'm feeling something stirring in this place. It's something I've never experienced before. This was a Roman colony. There was no expression of the Holy Spirit in that place before these men had entered into it, I believe. And so they're hearing this thing going, what is this? And, and so they're listening, they're hearing it. And then the earthquake comes and all the chains are broken, all the shackles come off and all the prison doors fling open and everybody stays put. <laughs> 
What would your response have been if you're, you're thrown into prison and suddenly your freedom is there? The doors are open. The shackles are gone. We're gapping it. We're out of here. We are free. But they stayed where they were. Why did they stay where they were? Because they knew the mission wasn't finished. Paul and Silas stood there and they said, we didn't come here to be free. We came here for mission. We came here to plant the church. We didn't come here to be freed from a situation that was obviously engineered by God. Not caused by God, but used by God because the next thing was the jailer comes in. And the jailer walks in and his response, he possibly would have been an old retired soldier put on the post. His last post was to look after this prison. And he knew that any prisoners escaping meant he would be put to death. And so his first response, when he sees that the earthquake and the prison doors open, his first response is to take his sword and to go to kill himself. And Paul calls out, don't do it. We're all still here. And I wonder, I wonder, I'm not saying this is Bible, but I wonder if they saw the jailer And they said, that's the man that called to us from across the sea. That's the Macedonian man we saw in our vision. We came here for him. This is why we're in this prison. This is why we are, and now we've been set free. So let's minister to this man. And the jailer comes in when he sees the prisoners are all there. No one's escaped. He sees the jailer and the jailer comes in and says, what must I do to be saved? That's a crazy response, right? It's a crazy response, you know, you'd think he'd be like, why haven't you left? You know, thank, thank goodness I don't need to kill myself and chain them back up. His response is, what must I do to be saved? Because the power of God, the power and presence of the Holy Spirit was so strong in that place that he was convicted of his sin and said, what must I do to be saved? That's crazy. That's the sort of power that we should still be living in today. That's like, God hasn't changed We're still on mission. We still have a a people to reach. We still have many who need to know the truth of the gospel and, and need to see it outworked and outlived through us. Every single one of you has a world that you're walking into, that God has purposes for, that people He wants you to reach. Family members, just like Diane with Trevor, one hour, there was a one hour window. And she really had prayed, I want, I want to see him come to, come to chapel, get saved. Like, that's crazy. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit using, and maybe Trevor's spirit had already been reaching out to God. He wasn't aware of it. Maybe this jailer was the Macedonian man who was crying out, who was saying, I'm stuck looking after this prison. There's got to be something more. I feel like the Holy Spirit's always stirring people's hearts. There's got to be something more. And so he, in a, in a a vision, the Macedonian man calls to Paul and Silas and they come over and, and so they reach the, the jailer and he gets saved. And this is all probably around midnight, maybe one in the morning. They, they take him out of prison, they go to the jailer's home and they, the whole household gets saved and then they get baptised, still in the early hours of the morning. And then it, in, in Acts 16, it says, the jailer fed them and tended their wounds. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like a pastor to me. (laughs) Maybe that jailer and his family became foundational members and the pastor of the church in Philippi. Again, it's not Bible, but makes sense to me. A Macedonian man called to them. Their response was, we're going to praise in the midst of our situation. We know we are on mission. We know we are called, so we choose to praise. We choose to respond in the right way. And God's plan was outworked through that, which is pretty amazing. Um, I, I can remember, you know, being at Saddleback Church a number of years ago. Uh, we were there with the parachute band and leading worship, and there was a, a beautiful African woman. She was a princess from, I think, from Zambia. Uh, and she was, and it was um, advocate, uh, AIDS Awareness Week. Um, and uh, Rick Warren's wife Kay is a, a very a big sort of supporter or advocate advocate for AIDS awareness. But anyway, so it was that week, and this they brought in this African woman. She was a princess, and she basically had nursed both her parents through um, HIV. They'd both died. She herself was HIV positive, um, not through you know any means, but just just was, Um, but she was also a born-again Christian. She also had a nine-year-old daughter who she knew was probably HIV positive as well. But she was there traveling the world talking about the need to understand AIDS and AIDS awareness and just, and all of that. But she made this one statement, 
and it floored me. She just said, you know, she unpacked her journey and then she just said, I count it an honor that God has called me or seen me worthy to carry this disease for his glory. And I remember going, oh my gosh, I count it an honor basically to carry this disease for God's glory. God hadn't healed her. I don't know where she is now, but I count it an honor to carry this disease for God's glory. That's a response. That's a pretty crazy response. I think I had a cold that week. I was complaining. Complaining about a runny nose and feeling a bit snuffly, a little bit blocked up. I count it an honor to carry this disease for God's glory. I'm like, I'm never complaining about having a cold again. I, it was so, it, it actually was one of those moments that really changed my life quite radically and realizing everything we walk through, we have a choice to respond to it in a way that is going to bring glory to God. And why? Because my joy is in Him. It's in Him. It's in the goodness of God. We've sung about that this morning. It's not in God working out our situations and God turning things around the way we want them to, will we choose to praise and respond in every situation in a way that brings glory to God? Because that's going to be pretty crazy. Here's the thing, point number four, and this is a little bit weird and maybe a little bit too soon after last year, but choose to Zoom. (laughs) Choose to Zoom. Choose to Zoom out. (laughs) Your story is is a part of a much bigger story. The story of God, the story of history, the story of mankind and him redeeming us and bringing us back to himself. And we've got to see our story in that light. What we're walking this, I don't know, for um, some it's it's a longer time, for some it's a shorter time. But the the portion of life that we're allotted on this earth is a little part of a much, much bigger story. Your story is much bigger than just your momentary circumstances. The choice you make to praise and to worship through everything. The choice you make to say, Jesus, you're my sufficiency. My relationship with you is the only thing that's, that satisfies, that, that gives me the hope. that And, and it, it's independent of my circumstances. No matter what I walk through, Jesus, I still have you. You're my sufficiency. You're my joy. You're my delight. I have everything I need when I have you, Jesus. That's why Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament epistles from jail not from a place of physical freedom, from a place of physical confinement. He wrote most of the incredible epistles to the, to the churches he planted. And, um, and I, I love Philippians, again, you know, the, the book to the church that was planted through that whole journey of Acts 16. Um, I love when Paul basically said, um, all these things that I once thought very worthwhile, he's talking about his Jewish history, his, his history and his credentials as a Jew. And he's just basically, basically says, no, this is, uh, I think, oh, it is in Philippians. I think it's Philippians. Anyway, Galatians, maybe Philippians. I think it's Philippians. But he basically says, all the things that I once counted as worthwhile and took such pride in, all those things, he's like, count them worth less than nothing in order to have Christ and to be one with Him. I've thrown them all away. All that stuff, everything that I built my life on is considered, and the Bible actually says, the translation could be seen as dog dung, like just rubbish, garbage, dirty, filthy. I count everything that I thought was so important as nothing, less than nothing, compared to the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord and being one with Him. that's That's a relationship of intimacy. That's a relationship with the heart of God, not with the rules. Paul knew what it was to live by the rules. He knew what it was to keep every law. He said, as a Pharisee, I have kept every law. There is none that was more perfect than me. That's a bold claim. That's the law. That's what he kept. And then he met Jesus. And his life was radically turned around. And from that moment on, he lived a life of a relationship with the heart of God. That's always been God's heart. And, you know, and when we choose to see the bigger picture, when we choose to zoom out and realise that the, the, the life we're walking today, the life that God's got us walking, the world He has us walking into, part of a big picture, that, that should put a fire in our souls. That should, we're on mission, guys. We're on mission. We have family members. Most of my family are not saved. Most of my family, my sister, myself, 
and my mum who passed away this year. We were the only ones that are saved. My family is my mission field. You know, I, and, I, and, and I really don't know how to reach them apart from just authentically living out my relationship with Jesus and hopefully they can see it and tell them when they ask questions. But that's my mission field. I, I, I'm, we're on mission. We're on mission in our workplaces. We're on mission with our families. We're on mission, you know, when we go to the supermarket and have a chance just to smile at someone. That's part of the big picture. Let's be kind. Let's spread the love of Jesus. Because in the end, and I will wrap up, sorry, I'm probably going on a bit. But in the end, Jesus basically said, I've come not to do away with the law, because the law was good. The law was giving us a framework to find our way back to God some rules to live by so that we could actually draw near to God, holy God. But, but, but that was never God's intent. He created us from a place of love and we kind of went way away from Him. So He said, okay, well, this is the first step back to relationship with me, the law. Don't do this. Do do this. Don't do that thing. Do do this more. You'll find your, your life is lived in a way that pleases me and that draws, draws me near to you. But Jesus then came and said, I didn't come to do away with the law. The law is good, but I came to fulfill it. Everything about me is summing up the law. That I've always, it has always been about relationship with my Father's heart. And that's what He offers you. And my death and resurrection, that sacrifice is what makes that possible. Just accept it. And so, so um, now we're in a relationship with the heart of God. And, and Jesus basically said, when some Pharisees said to him, which is the most important law? He said, the, the whole law can be summed up in two. Love God, love people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you fulfill those two things, you're going to be fulfilling the whole law. But we're not called to fulfill the law. We're called to just love Jesus and then let the love of Jesus outwork through us, flow through us. So choose to zoom, choose to zoom out. And when you look at, you know, this whole story with Paul, Lydia, the demon-possessed girl, the jailer, they were part of this big picture of, of um, the, the planting of the church in Philippi, which then, you know, many other churches planted, which impacted Europe. Pretty, pretty crazy. And I, and I guess just to wrap up, I want to ask you, what is, what is the journey or the story, the chapter that you're walking, the chapter of the big story that your life is? How are you walking it out in a way that's going to impact others? Because Paul and Silas praying and worshiping in that, in that um, prison, we've all heard the, you know, the, the, the story before, but that, that brought breakthrough for so many. And I wonder if there's things about our life and the, cho- the, the choice to respond in the right way is going to bring breakthrough, not just for us, but for generations to come. What is your life, the choices you're making with your life? And it's all wrapped up in worship because worship is about the way we live our lives, not just what we do here on Sunday. How is the way you're living your life as a worship offering to God impacting others? We're on mission. We're on mission. So that's just a question to leave you with. You can answer that one yourselves later <laughs> with the Holy Spirit. But I just want to pray this morning. And, and, you know, when we think about the fact that we are called to a, a relationship with, with God, you know, it, it can be possible to sit in church for years and years and never have caught that. And I guess I want to just open up the altar really quickly this morning, not like physically, but, but just if there's anyone in here this morning who has kind of maybe missed the bigger picture, you've forgotten maybe because of your temporal circumstances that there's a much bigger story that you're a part of, and maybe you've kind of lost that vision, that sense of mission and where you're heading and what God's doing with you. I want to encourage you this morning, you can pick it up again. You can pick it up again. There's a mission that God has for you that's going to excite you, that's going to give you purpose and meaning and a a sense of um, just passion as you're walking out that journey. But then there might be some who have lost kind of that first love or that sense of relationship with Jesus. And I I want to say to you this morning, again, He's a prayer away. He's a heart prayer away. You know, it's not just about a a spoken prayer. I, I became a Christian when I was 12 years old doing my paper run. In Wellington, in Wellington, like Jesus met me on the street. I'd heard about him, grew up in a Presbyterian church, heard about him, didn't realise I could have a relationship with him. But at 12 years old, he met me. I surrendered my heart to him. It was a simple prayer, God, I give up. I don't even know that I'm meant to ask you into my heart, but just come in and change me. Just, And I felt him flooded and I've never been the same since. Turned my life around from that moment and I've walked with him ever since. 
And it was, there was no altar call. There was no message preached. But I prayed the prayer that day, and Jesus changed my heart. So I, I want to ask if there's anyone this morning, and maybe you've known him but you've walked away or you've never actually made that commitment to follow him, this morning's a chance. He might be knocking on the door of your heart. So with every eye closed, if that's you this morning and you know you need to reconnect with Jesus again, not the Jesus of the rules, but Jesus of relationship, then why don't you just pop your hand up and I'd love to pray with you. And if not, and you're just making a response in your heart, that's absolutely fine too because God sees. And so I'd love us all to pray this prayer this morning. I'm just going to pray it. You repeat the lines after me. It could be that you're recommitting your heart to Him or you're just opening it up for the first time. Maybe you're not brave enough to raise your hand, but that's okay because God sees and He hears your genuine prayer. So let's just all together repeat this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Thank you that you brought me into a relationship with the heart of God. I accept what you did for me right now. Thank you for washing my heart clean. Thank you for making my life completely new. I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name, amen.